2 Corinthians. There's a, uh, there's a common sense law in life, and there's a biblical law that basically go hand in hand. Doesn't take much of a genius to figure it out. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 6. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. This happens to be a law of life. Hmm. You know, if you're a farmer and you, you don't want to plant seed, or if you just put a little bit of seed out there, your harvest is either going to be nothing or it's just going to be a little bit. If you put a whole bunch of stuff out there, generally you're going to get a whole bunch. It works in every facet of life. Whether you're a salesman, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an office worker, it doesn't make any difference. It's a law of life. The more you put into something, the more you're going to get out of something. There's another verse in 1 Corinthians, I won't bother to turn that one right now because we've, we've looked at it a dozen times, and that has to do with the fact that every single thing in this book, every little account of a story, every little dialogue, every little event that took place is in here for a reason, and the reason is it is an example for us. So that we can see what God does in certain situations. We can see how we are to react in certain situations. And so God puts all these things in the Bible so that we in turn can know how to respond, how to react, and how to do what he wants us to do. Turn to another one. Numbers chapter 32. Numbers 32. And in Numbers chapter 32, we have a verse, verse 23. This is God speaking. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. This is another axiomatic law in life. You can, you can get away with something for a long time, maybe. You can hold secrets from each other, husband, wife, vice versa, kid, parent, boss, employer, employee. We can hold secrets for a long time, but eventually it's going to come to light. You can't hold it forever. And the great equalizer in that is that we all have to die someday. We all have to stand before God someday. And if you've got a particular sin or a secret or th something that you did and it was never discovered here, be sure your sin will find you out. When you stand before God, it will be revealed and cat will be out of the bag. Another little law of life. You just, you don't get away with it. One more, and then we'll jump into the, the main part here. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can pull one over on me, or I might be able to pull one over on my wife, or, you know, you can fool your teacher or your boss or so forth. But boy, you don't mess with God. He has, he has ways. And the unfortunate thing is that we get so used to fooling or hiding things from each other that it's a kind of carryover thing. And if we do something bad in the eyes of God and we don't get reprimanded or caught immediately, our nature seems to jump into the category of, oh, I got away with it. No, God is not mocked. You don't thumb your nose at God. You don't roll your eyes at God. You don't blow him off like you can people. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, there's some examples. Remember, we looked at the verse, in, well, we didn't look at it, but mentioned the verse in Galatians. And the one in 1 Corinthians about the examples. God has put certain examples in this book to give us warning, to give us education, to show us the way, to reveal consequences. He's covered all the bases here. The first logical one to start with is Adam and Eve. The conditions in which they found themselves was absolutely perfect. Weather was perfect. Soil was perfect. Environment was perfect. Everything was perfect. We don't know how long after the creation of Adam and Eve, when they were set in that garden, we don't know how long it took before Satan came and tempted them, and, you know, the wheels fell off. Could have been 15 minutes, could have been 15 years. I, I don't know. But we do know that they were confronted with a temptation, that they fell to that temptation. They gave into it, they disobeyed God, and in the disobeying of God, there triggered certain consequences remember you reap what you sow that this is a law it just you know two people get together they're going to have a kid they're not going to have a goat they're not going to have a, a chipmunk they're going to have a kid you plant an apple seed you're going to get an apple you're not going to get pears you're not going to get watermelons it's just it's a fact of life you get what you sow. They sowed sin. They disobeyed God. They rejected his word. Now the consequences fall into place. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. He said, don't eat the tree. What did they do? They ate the tree. You don't get any more disobedient than that. They can't say, well, you know, there was sin in my life. I was predisposed to do it, so I had to do it. No, at that point, there wasn't any predisposed thing of sin. They can't say, well, you know, I grew up looking at sin all around me all my life. I see people do bad things. I see some people get away with it, seemingly. I see some people prosper because they did this or did that. They didn't have any of these excuses. A perfect setting, perfect communion with God, a perfect environment, everything. No in inherent sin within them that they can blame. They thumbed their nose at God. They chose to disbelieve him. Now the consequences come. If you pour a pitcher of water on the side of a hill, water's going to run down. It's a consequence. If you jump off a building, you're going to fall. It's a consequence. 
That's what life is. Life is a series of consequences. Action and reaction. Every single thing you do, there's a consequence to it. If you're driving a car and you turn the wheel to the left, you're going to go left. Put your foot on the brake, you're going to stop. Put your foot on the gas, you're going to go. Everything is consequences. So what did Adam and Eve have to go through? Well, they had to find out what sin was like. They were now sinners after they disobeyed God. They weren't sinners before. Now they're sinners. Sinners beget sinners. So they're kids. And their kids. And their kids. All the way down to you and I. We're all sinners by virtue of the fact of our DNA. Not what we initially did. We came out sinners. It's not that we were born innocent and we become sinners by virtue of our actions. No, the Bible is very, very clear. We are born in sin and trespasses. It is what we are, not what we become. So sin, expulsion, they're booted out of that perfect environment. Now they have to contend with weather. Now they have to contend with weeds. Now they have to contend with labor. Now they have to contend with all this stuff that they didn't have to bother with before. Pain. Now Eve, when she has a kid, it's going to hurt. And when her daughter has a kid, it's going to hurt. Pain in childbearing. Boom. Every female on the planet. I'm not sure about Mary. I don't know what kind of slack God gave Mary, if any. And one of the biggest was, there's a phrase in the New Testament that refers to Satan as the God of this world. Little g, no, not big g, Satan didn't create the world, he doesn't sustain the world. But he was the Lord of this world, or the King of this world, or the God of this world. That used to be Adam. Until the day Satan tricked him, and he fell. And that title moved from Adam to Satan. Consequences. Children of Israel. They come out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea, Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to the top. God gives him the commandments. He comes down. They organize themselves. Approximately three million people came out of Egypt. Their standing army was over 600,000 troops. So when you see that movie, The Ten Commandments, and Charlton Heston is leading them out of Egypt with a big staff in his hand and so forth, and you see about 400 people behind him. Uh, that couldn't be any more, I, I realize it's a movie, but the impression that it gives is that it was a little band of people that come out. No. When Moses led those people out of Egypt, there was approximately 3 million people that came. As I said, just the army alone, 600,000 troops they had. And you count all the 12 tribes. So they spent approximately a year and a half to two years when they leave Egypt until they're ready to go into the promised land. They've got to get their battle formation set, the organization of the camps set. They've got the law from God. Moses is organizing the thing. Now they're ready to go into the land that God has promised them. You remember the story, how Moses picks 12 guys, spies, to go into the land. The town that they're in is a little town called Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea. And from there, Moses sends the 12 spies out. They survey the land, they come back. 
The land, they said, is the most unbelievable thing we've ever seen in our lives. And they have just come from the breadbasket of the world. Egypt was no shrinking violet. Egypt basically fed the world at that point. But this land, they said, the grapes are so big, the clusters are so big, it takes two guys with a, a stave between them to carry these grapes. The land is flowing with milk and honey. That's where that expression, the land of milk and honey, began. It was the description of the spies of Israel before they got in there. Moses says, great, let's go. Hang on just a second. There's already people there, you know. The Gergesites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, I mean, just the list goes on and on and on. The land was occupied. And he said, these guys are tough, and they're big. They are the sons of Anak, the sons of the giants. Hmm. They have walled cities. We can't, we can't beat them. No matter how good the land is, no matter how much we want it, we can't beat them. Moses says, no, God has said that it, it's ours to occupy. We've got to occupy it. We can't just sit here and wait for God to do it all. He's told us to go in. So, well, let's take a vote. So ten hands go up and said, no, we can't do it. Two hands go up. Joshua and Caleb said, we can do it. The other ten are arguing and bickering. How do you figure we can do it? Blah, blah, blah. He said, because God said. I don't care about the walls. I don't care about the giants. I don't care about the population. I don't care about any of this other stuff. God said it's ours and we can do it. And he's told us to go. And the other ten shouted him down. Said, no. We can't do it. We're not going to do it. And so half-heartedly, Moses whips up the crowd, whips up the tribes and so forth. He says, no, we, we've got to do it. And so the people are reluctant. And so they go in half-heartedly with no courage, no vim and vinegar, none of that stuff, and they get their butts kicked. Total defeat. So they crawl back into the wilderness with their tail between their legs. And at this point, God is, there's smoke coming out of his ears. He's so mad at these people. He says, I'll tell you what, guys. For the next 38 years, you're going to walk in this wilderness till every single one of you guys, 20 years old and up, is dead. You didn't want to go into the promised land when I told you? You're not going into the promised land. You'll walk in this wilderness until every last one of you is dead. And I'll let your kids go in. And I'm going to make two exceptions. Joshua will get to go, and Caleb will get to go. Because they're the only two that stood up for me, God speaking. I'll let them go. The rest of you clowns, you're dead right here. And so for the next 38 years, which makes a total of 40 years, they wandered in that wilderness. Not because they were lost, not because they didn't know where to go, they didn't have a compass. They're not going to get in back into that promised land until every one of those people that had decided that they didn't want to trust God went. Deuteronomy chapter 9. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 9. Look at verse 23. Deuteronomy 9, 23. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then 
ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye believed him not, nor hearkened unto his voice. Ye have been rebelled rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. It was unbelief. It wasn't just the fear of the walls. It wasn't just the fear that the guys were big, giant-sized. See, that's the excuse that we use. That's how we redefine the definitions of here. Oh, I'm afraid. No. From God's perspective, you weren't afraid. From God's perspective, you didn't believe him. That's how God sees it. Consequences. God says, there's a land flowing with milk and honey. Go take it. They didn't believe him. He says, okay. Consequence. 40 years wandering in this wilderness till you're all dead. There's two people. It's found in the book of Acts. I won't read the whole thing. Their names are Ananias and Sapphira. Christians. This is right after the resurrection and so forth. This is when, you know, Peter is preaching and the you know, 5,000 people get saved one day, 3,000 more get saved the next day. I mean, things are just going crazy here. And two Christians, Ananias and Sapphira. They decided one day, and this was when the church was in its infant formation, and they were really, really up against it in the sense that there was, it was a, an outlaw group to start with. Christianity started as an outlaw group. They had to meet in houses. They had to, they, they couldn't openly do what they wanted to do without fear of retaliation from the government or from mobs or from the Pharisees or the Sadducees. I mean, people did it. Stephen did it. He got stoned and killed. Peter did it. He got thrown in jail. Barnabas and these guys all did it. They all got, you know, beat up or jailed or, or something. So there was a consequence to speaking up for Jesus. But in the early days, they had to basically band together as a group. And so it was a, a socialistic type thing at the very, very beginning until God told them to disperse and get out of there. But at the first, they had to watch out for each other. So the church bands together. And in order to finance this thing and keep it going, people would sell houses, land, farms, branches, whatever it happened to be, put the money in the pot, and everybody would live off that for that period of time. There was a time where these two, Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, they said, we have a piece of property over here. Let's sell that. We'll take the money, give it to the church, and everything will be hunky-dory. Okay. Well, they did that. They sold the piece of property. But they held back a portion of the proceeds of the sale for themselves. And you say, well... What's the big deal? I mean, if I want to, you know, sell my house right now and give a half a million to the church and keep a couple of hundred thousand for myself, what, what's the harm there? The harm was that they had said that they gave it all to the church. So that they get the praise of men, they can get the pat on the back and they can get all this other stuff. So the sin wasn't that they held it back. Because it was theirs to do with what they want. They can give it away. They can keep it. They didn't have to sell it. There's no restriction or uh, no law here. God's not forcing them to do anything. 
but it's when that they said that they gave it all. Oops, now they crossed the line. And Peter makes a very big point. He's talking to Ananias. He said, look, when the property was yours, you can do with whatever you want, correct? Yeah. When you sold it, you can do whatever you want with the proceeds, correct? Yeah. Then why did you say that you gave it all when you really kept back a portion for yourself? It's not that you kept it back. It, it's yours to do with it if you want. It's when you said that this is all. That's when they, you cross the line. Peter says, because you've lied to the Holy Spirit, you're dead. The guy flops over dead as a doornail. I mean, Peter's talking to him. He doesn't hit him on the head. He doesn't shoot him. He doesn't stab him. He just talks. He says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Boom, you're dead. The guy flops over dead. And so Peter calls the young guys in. He says, pick them up, take them out, bury them. So the guys are taking them out. They're burying them. They got the hole dug. They chuck them in the hole. And at that time, his wife, Sapphira, comes in. And she doesn't know any of this has happened. She has no idea that her husband's dead. She has no idea what's going on. Peter confronts her. He says, oh, by the way, the property that you sold, yeah? And you said that you gave it all to the proceeds to the church, correct? Yeah. He says, you lied, didn't you? Uh, uh, hubbada, hubbada, hubbada. He says, you hear the feet of the young man coming through that door right now? She says, yeah. Those are the feet of the young man that just took your husband out and put him in a hole. You're with him. And she goes down dead as a doornail. So they buried them both. And what was the great sin that they did? They lied to the Holy Spirit. It was greed. There was consequences. They lied, boom, they paid the consequence. They wanted to present themselves as something that they really weren't. Yeah, look at me. What a great Christian I am. Man, I took this property and I sold it and I gave it all to the church. Give me a pat on the back. Sing a song for me. Ain't I great? Pride. It's greed. And there are consequences. Now, they got their consequences immediately. There was no court. There was no trial. There was no grand jury. None of this stuff. Peter just looked at him and said, you're dead. Boom, they're dead. That was it. That's the ultimate consequence right there. We go back. One last one. David. Yep, that David. The one and the only person referred to by God in this book as a man after God's own heart. Abraham was known as the friend of God. David was known and named by God as a man after God's own heart. You don't get any higher up on the totem pole than that. I mean, I don't care if you're the king of the world. What does God think of you? God, who looks in your heart, knows all your sins, all your flaws, all your strengths, and all your shortcomings, and he looks down at all these people, and he said, that, is a man after my own heart. You don't get any bigger. Well, David did a lot of things, a lot of bad things. But the one that he did that ticked God off more than any of the others was in the case of Bathsheba. It wasn't just the adultery part, because David had committed adultery for years before that. He had three or four wives, plus a bunch of concubines, which are 
you know, when the <laughs> wives are busy, then you, you, you take them for variety, if nothing else. So David had all of this stuff going on. And he'd done this for years. This is just the, the pattern in that culture in that day and age. You have wife number one, wife number two, wife number three, you know, the string of concubines. They weren't legally or technically wives as such. They were just, you know, other females that you would, whatever. So it wasn't just that. David had killed people before. He'd killed people by the thousands before. So it wasn't just the adultery. It wasn't just the killing. It, it wasn't any of these things that set God off. For some reason, in the case of Bathsheba, David crossed the line in God's estimation here. And I think from God's perspective was that Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, was one of David's bodyguards. A guy who daily, for years, would put himself in the line of fire. He would take the bullet, as it were, for David. And David knew it. And one day the army's off, fighting. But David is not with them this time. And usually he's with the army. But this time he wasn't. He was still at his palace. And one night he's at the, on the roof of the palace and he looks down and across the street or across the plaza or whatever it was, he sees this young lady taking a bath. He looks at her and he says, wow. Now he's the king. He's already got four or five wives, a string of concubines. He can have basically whatever he wants. Well, as the king, knowing this, hardwired into him, he says, I want her. And so he fetches her. She comes over. Boom. The deed is done. A few weeks or a couple of months later, she says, oh, oops, by the way, I'm pregnant. And David goes into panic mode. Why? I mean, this happened, I'm sure it happened to him a dozen times in life. But there's the dynamics of the friendship here. There's the dynamics of this is the wife of somebody who I am close to. This is the wife of somebody who puts their lives on the line for me every day. And somehow, in David's mind, he, be, he freaks out now. He says, oh, good grief, what do I do, what do I do? Oh, I know. I'll retrieve Uriah from the battlefield. I'll have him come home for a you know, two or three day leave. He'll sleep with his wife. And then, you know, seven, eight months later, after this portion, when the kid comes, well, that this kid was premature for a few weeks, you know, big, no big deal, and it'll be all hidden. He says, that's what I'll do. So he tells the general, get Uriah, send him back home, give him a leave, and Uriah comes home, he's all happy, you know, whatever. And then nighttime comes, and he's supposed to go to sleep with his wife, Bathsheba, and David looks down at their house across the way, and he sees Uriah sleeping on the doorstep instead of in his bed with Bathsheba. And the next day he calls Uriah. He says, what's the deal here? You're home on leave. You haven't seen your wife in months. And you get home and you're sleeping on the doorstep instead of with your wife? And Uriah says, look, I'm a soldier. And my buddies are on the front lines. They don't get to sleep with their wife tonight. They don't get leave to come home and indulge themselves in pleasure. So as long as the army is there, I'm not going to do it either. And David says, oh, God, now what do I do? Holy mackerel. So in panic mode, the next day, when Uriah leaves, he gives him a note to give to Abner, the general. So he tells Uriah, when you see Abner, when you report in, you give him this note. And he did. 
And the note said, you take Uriah to Abner, you take Uriah, you put him on the front line, you put him in the thick of the hottest battle, and when it's at its peak, you have everybody move off and leave him isolated by himself. And he'll get killed. And that's exactly what happened. And that was the line that David crossed, that God said, that's it, boom. There are now consequences in your life. And there were. In Psalm 51, when David finally confesses his sin, it is related and told that because you did this, there are certain consequences that are going to come in your life. The first one was that the sword shall never depart from your house. In other words, there's going to be trouble for the rest of your life as far as your, your family is concerned. You screwed up this guy's chance for family. Now your family is going to pay the price on this thing. His wives all ended up hating his guts. His wives did everything they could to harm him, to embarrass him, to shame him. His concubines were all taken, put on a pavilion, you know, a raised tent type thing in front of the entire city of Jerusalem and were all forced to have sex. In public, everybody could see all David's concubines lined up. And you know who it was that did it? His son. One of his daughters was raped by her brother. With all David's family here. The baby that came from David and Bathsheba dies. I mean, it was just a you talk about a soap opera. You talk about a tragedy. This guy's life was a living hell from that moment until the day he died. His son rebels against him. His son forces him to flee the capital. The son gets killed in this fiasco of a revolt. David was never the same. Consequences. Whatever your action is, there's going to be a ripple effect. There's going to be a domino effect. There are going to be consequences. Another little rule is just simply this. You reap what you sow. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You always reap more than you sow. If you take an apple seed, plant it in the ground, an apple tree comes up. How many apples does that apple tree have on it? I don't know, two, three hundred, four hundred apples? How many seeds are in these apples? So you sow an apple seed, you get a whole tree of apples. You sow a kernel of corn, you get a great big stock of corn. You always reap more than you sow. It's just another law of life. And you always reap according to how you sow. Look over in 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians 9, 6. This I say, he which soweth sparingly 
shall reap also sparingly. That means a little bit. If you're a farmer and you got, you know, 100 pounds of seed, but you're only going to plant one pound of seed, well, you're only going to get one pound of seed's worth of stuff. If you plant all 100 pounds, then your, your yield and your crop is going to be that much bigger. He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Another law of life. It doesn't matter where you are or what you are. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. So consequences. It's a hard thing for us to understand. It's a hard thing for us to get. And yet, when you look around, you can see it in every facet of your life. You can see it in every facet of anybody else's life. We call it karma. Or we call it justice. Or we call it, you know, we, we have a million little names for it. But it's always the same thing. It's the law of consequences. Sowing and reaping. It is a biblical law and it will not change. Until we're dead and gone. Heavenly Father. I, I wish it weren't so, but I can't get around the fact that it is a fact of life. I wish that sometimes I could do something and there wouldn't be a ripple effect, or I could say something and there wouldn't be a ripple effect, but there always is. Even in a message such as this, there's going to be reactions and if not so much with, with the, the small group that we have here, those by extension, somebody's going to hear this and they're going to be offended by it. Somebody's going to hear this and they're going to say, how dare he presume that because I did this or that, I'm, there's going to be a payback someday. And we all know that there will. It might not be in this lifetime. That, that's the, the crux of the whole matter, Lord. I mean, how many times, Father, have we looked at people who get away with things year after year after year after year, and they prosper in the bad th things that they have done or the bad things that they have said or the shady way in which they've gotten ahead? And we know, Lord, that at the end of the day, you're not mocked. You're not going to let it pass. And yet sometimes justice for us doesn't come fast enough. So, Lord, each and every person who hears a message such as this is going to have a different reaction. And I pray, Lord, that we can get past the initial, oh, not me, or you're talking to somebody else, or you can't possibly mean me. Lord, I pray that we can get past that and realize that all sin, all sin is ultimately directed against you. I may hit my friend I may cheat on somebody. I might do something to somebody. But ultimately, every sin that I ever committed is against you. And because of that, you will dole out and dish out the consequences accordingly. And payback will come eventually. God help us to realize that we have to stop this chain. We have to stop this progressive mindset that we just do something and if we get away with it, oh great, we'll try it again next time. God helps to realize that all sin is ultimately directed against you. If we can get that fixed in our heads, then a lot of the rest of this stuff will be solved. Bless us, Lord. Help us in Jesus' name.